When the wintry winds start blowing and the snow is starting in a fall, then my eyes and western. Ed Shad, Eddie, was nine years old when he left Butte, Montana in 1926 after the sudden death of his father. Eddie and his mother Sylvia probably spent a couple days on a train from Butte down to Los Angeles, California to go live with Sylvia's parents, Dennis and Kate Egan. Ed's father died in July, and he and his mother were probably in L.A. by September in time for the new school year. My dad died uh, up in Butte when I was well, about nine. And uh, so then my mother and I came down to California and, and uh, her mother, who had been from Butte, had already come down mm -hmm. and she and uh, my grandfather lived here. So then the remaining years prior to marriage, I lived with my grandmother and grandfather. Imagine the skyline of Los Angeles in 1927 as Eddie and his mother made their new home in Los Angeles with the new city hall under construction, future icon of the city and tallest building in L.A. Eddie, with his mother, moved in with his grandparents into a house on 21st Street, about two miles south of Los Angeles High School. The four of them actually lived in two houses on that quiet residential street between 1926 and 1932. The houses were relatively small and modest, according to the account of Ed Shad years later, so the houses there today may bear little resemblance to the houses back then. So now we came down, we lived on 21st Street in uh, LA, and when I lived on 21st Street, incidentally, it was only a two-bedroom house. It was a flat, two-family flat, and uh, my mother had a bedroom, and my grandmother and grandfather, and they had a, a porch on the side, and they just had, like, awnings. They were, uh, I don't know what they were, canvas, I guess. Did they crank them? Yeah, but we kept them down because we made a room out of them. And that had cold and you know what, in the winter, but uh, we had a cot out there, and that was my room. And then when we moved down on Bronson, it was three bedroom, and so I had to live in my own. As a young boy, Ed had quite a stamp collection, assisted by his grandfather, Dennis Egan. Unfortunately, I haven't had many hobbies. That's why I would say that I've never been handy with my hands. I had stamp collecting. I would say that was it. I used to, uh, in fact, I had one that my grandfather, Dennis, got me one stamp, and he paid $20 for it. It was a 19, 1847 stamp, and it was the first one in, I had a big book, it was about that thick, you know. It was all countries, but started out with America, United States. And it was the very first stamp, single out all by itself at the top. And that was, it was one of the oldest stamps that they expected anybody to possibly have. And he had paid 20 bucks for this thing, and then I used to buy all kinds of them used, and any time new issues came out, and they didn't come out like they do now, they come out every five minutes with one. But, uh, when a new issue come out, I'd send away for a first day cover, and what they do is, you know, you write an envelope with your name on it, and they put this stamp on it and cancel it, and just mail it, empty the envelope back to your first day cover. And then I'd buy maybe a sheet or a block or something of all these stamps. Ed probably collected stamps from when he was about 10 years old to maybe 13 years old. In 1929, when Ed was 12 years old, the Graf Zeppelin airship was making a round-the-world flight and, coming in from Japan, landed at Mines Field, what later would become LAX. This event was commemorated in stamps. And I bought, like, the Graf Zeppelins. I can remember those. They were 65 dollar thirty and two sixty three stamps so this is maybe five bucks in that area they must be worth a hundred dollars so we put out for the graph zeppelin which was a german dirigible and uh, uh ironically normally a, a stamp unused is more valuable but the graph zeppelin stamps the used ones were more valuable because the only time they were used was on the graph zeppelin flying across the the ocean. So those became the really the mm -hmm. ones because they had a special cancellation mark on them and 
and they didn't use them just for ordinary mail because 65 cents or 260 or whatever, nobody would pay that, you know, for an airplane. But, uh, but I had a lot of stamps for many years. As a boy, Ed spent a lot of time with both his mother, Sylvia, and his grandfather, Dennis Egan, who seems to have been a sort of professional gambler. Sometimes Dennis Egan would take his grandson, Ed, downtown to his bookie. When he came to California, he became a gambler as a profession. I mean, he was, you might say, retired. But he would go downtown almost like you would go to your job in downtown LA. I can remember, in fact, he used to take me down a few times. Were these car dreams? Is that what No, you? this was, a, he was horse playing at this time, horse playing. And uh, he'd go down to this bookie place and he'd spend the whole day. And I can remember he'd come home with a thousand dollars, which back when I was a kid was a lot of money, you know, a thousand dollars. He'd lay it on my grandmother, but then maybe he didn't have any winners to speak of, and he's drawing it back, and, you know, 10 today, 20 tomorrow, and pretty soon it's all gone, and he hasn't won. So it was lean and fat days, is what it was. I believe, very strongly, is why I could not be a gambler. I mean, like, I go to Vegas, everybody goes to Vegas to gamble. I go to Vegas to see the shows, the good eating, and I'm completely bored when Helen wants to gamble a little bit. I don't gamble, and I think that's probably more than anything else is seeing uh, what happened in my family with the good days and the lean days. And there were more lean days than there were good days, in my opinion. Ed's Grandpa Egan, in addition to gambling himself, also worked at various times as part of the gambling industry near L.A. Ed sometimes visited his Grandpa Egan on weekends on offshore gambling boats three miles off the coast, where he worked and lived. Ed was about 12 years old at the time. Then he got involved in, uh, through someone uh, in the gambling deal. He worked on the boats off of uh, Santa Monica, I guess it was. So the Long Beach. Yeah, it's off of Long Beach, I guess. Yeah. 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 And uh, I used to go out there like on Sunday. We'd uh, we a lot on the water taxi and uh, have dinner and roam around the thing. And he, he ran a roulette wheel or something like that out there on the boat. This was about the time of the 1929 stock market crash, but gambling continued. In 1930 or thereabouts, Dennis Egan worked at Agua Caliente, just south of San Diego in Tijuana, Mexico. This was Vegas before Vegas. With gambling and horse racing illegal in California, and not yet legal in Nevada, and with prohibition still in effect in the United States, wealthy Americans and Hollywood celebrities flocked to the Agua Caliente Resort. Charlie Chaplin, Buster Keaton, Hal Jolson, Bing Crosby, Howard Hughes, and Al Capone all went there. Agua Caliente had a luxurious hotel, huge swimming pool and spa, golf course, dog track, horse races, casino gambling, lots of entertainment, and its own airstrip. And then there were days when he was in San Diego, or not San Diego, Agua Caliente. At the racetrack. Who was that an employee of the track? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And they had this big clubhouse, and we'd go up in the clubhouse, and they had all kinds of gambling there. You know, roulette, uh, blackjack, whatever. But Ed's childhood wasn't all tagging along with his gambling grandpa and visiting gambling boats and racetracks. He went to church regularly with his mother, Sylvia Egan and became an Eagle Scout in the Boy Scouts of America. Shortly after the death of his father in 1926, Ed began to go to church with his mother. And then after he died, he had always, I think, wanted my mother to become a Catholic, although he was not a practicing Catholic. Had she joined, I presume he would have started going. But I don't ever remember going to church. So after he died and we came to California, then I think she had a little remorse that maybe she should have joined the church. So she and I both became Catholics. Uh, this is how I became a Catholic. She, we, uh, we took the, uh, you know, catechism classes, not together, but I mean, she took them and I took them, and, and uh, she got, became Catholic for I did. I mean, she, she got like 
confession, communion, and confirmation almost like in one day after. So you were baptized when you were about nine or No, I was baptized a Catholic originally. Yes, initially. Yes, as a child, I'm beautiful. But then that was the extent of it. There was no practicing Catholic or any religion. Once Ed's mother, Sylvia, became Catholic, the two of them went to church all the time until she died when Ed was 16 years old. And after his mother died, Ed's grandmother, Kate Trembath, made sure he kept going to church. She was not a Catholic, but she made me go to catechism class and she'd read the catechism questions to me before I went to class. And she made sure I went to church after my mother died. And she, like I say, always had the, uh, no meat meals on Friday even though it didn't really mean that much to her, but she just did this. I don't know why, but I can laugh at all the Ed became a Boy Scout at age 12. He went to camps and activities and earned over 20 merit badges. With the encouragement of his mother, Sylvia, he became an Eagle Scout. Well, I got in when I was 12, and very enthusiastic about the Scouts, and we didn't have that big a uh, troop where we had a lot of activities. We went away, you know, once or twice a year, maybe on a camp out. And uh, twice I went to Big Pines. This was the highlight, I would say. Mm -hmm. But this had really had nothing to do with our particular troop. It was just something offered by the Boy Scouts. And they had a camp up there. We used to go up there for 10 days for $15 or something. And it included a bus trip up meals every day, and lodging, all, the whole bit in McGillan, you know. You didn't camp out, you stayed in a lot. Oh, no, they had, they had uh, barrack type places, and you had to do your turn at KP, and we went on hikes, you know, where they pack your lunch, and you go all day, and it really was fun. And I got a lot of merit badges while I was up there that summer, but uh, I was disenchanted before I reached Eagle. But my mother had said, you got to stay in until you become an Eagle Scout. So it took 21 merit badges, I think it was. And certain ones required, you know. But most of those I got up, in, up at this camp because pioneering and a few things were... So I got my Eagle badge in the box that came in. So I went to the meeting to receive my Eagle badge. And that was the last meeting I ever went to. <laughs> and all the years prior to that, I used to think, you know, well, I'll get that eagle badge, and I'll go to the meeting, and I'll wear that badge on my uniform, and uh, I'll wear it everywhere, you know. Never wore it. Never wore it, except the night they pinned it on me, and then they had a little box, and I put it back in the box, and I fulfilled my requirement. My mother said, you got to stay with an eagle scout, and that was it. I got my badge, and, <laughs> and that was the last meeting I ever went to. be there. It makes no difference where it leads me. I'll come running if you need me anytime, any day, anywhere.